Hi, I'm Jeff Miller. I'm Anthony Navarro, and welcome to Talk Out Loud, where we share the LGBTQIA plus narrative one story at a time. On this episode of Talk Out Loud, we're here with Jeff Miller. Jeff is the co-host and co-creator of Talk Out Loud. Growing up in Michigan and in Indiana, Jeff has fond memories of hearing some magical stories shared with him by his father and his church. As he was maturing, one of the stories that the church told did not allow for a part of who he was. Having to leave home to be himself, he realized that the self-destruction in his life would only turn around once he took ownership of it. In doing so, he found himself with a loving family, a farm, and eventually, true love. Let's hear Jeff's story. Well, this is new. <laughs> a change of pace. A little change of pace here. Yeah, you're in the uh, the other seat. Th- this is true. Yeah, but that's okay. Because, you know, over the... I don't know how long the show has been. The last how many months you've really been able to uh, help other people facilitate and share their experience and share their story. And I think it's important that you be able to share your experience and story as well. Don't you think you're selling it pretty good? Well, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think we have a choice (laughs) because here we are. Here we are. (laughs) So it's a beautiful day in Los Angeles. Sun is out blue sky and the trees are green but uh you're not from los angeles are you no i was born in columbus ohio yeah and then we we moved pretty quickly over to um michigan to grand rapids michigan my dad had a job in finance and we packed up and moved to michigan and i would kind of say that michigan is kind of like feels like home Mm -hmm. um it has just there's so much of, of life that's been spent there. It's like my safe place to go back to. But I, we we then moved to Indiana, to South Bend, Indiana, where uh, Pete Buttigieg is from. And uh, I went to junior high and high school there. So that's really like where a lot of my uh, education uh, was memories are, were, were spent at. But, but just to be clear, so like South Bend is... It, it's a from where your mom and dad's house is. It is a ten minute walk to the border of Michigan, so it wasn't a jump. Correct. If, if I yeah. was feeling homesick guy on the weekends, I could just you know catch a ride up to Michigan. Right. So not too far. You, that, well, well said. Yeah. And I think it's important also to point out is that uh, Chicago is actually less than two hours away from South Bend. So Chicago has kind of felt like also like since the age of like 17, 16, like my backyard as well too. Yeah. What would you say are some of the best memories that you have as a kid growing up? Oh, like those long summer nights. So Michigan is on Eastern time. It's like the farthest West you can be with still being on Eastern time. Mm -hmm. So like the sun doesn't set till like 10 o'clock at night. It's like 10, 15. It's magical. (laughs) Right. It's it's, it's, it's magical. I remember my, my parents like, I remember we were like five or six years old and my brother and I had bunk beds and my mom and dad putting us to, to like, you got to go to bed. And it was like eight o'clock was like our bedtime. And it was still like the kids were like using our swing set. Like our neighbors, I think were still like playing. <laughs> on. I was like, this is not fair. This is not, we should be allowed to be outside. The sun's still out. But just those long summer nights. I think there's something about time. You and I were talking about this the other day. Like even as a teenager, like, time is different. Like it almost, mm. the younger you are, like summer seems like it's last forever. A day seems more like the length of a week. Mm. But my dad would read to me like almost every night he would uh, come in to, to, to my room and he would, he would read me stories like from, from, from that, like probably since the age of two years old, to be honest. And, and it wasn't like, I mean, I'm sure it was like some Dr. Seuss stuff in the beginning, but it was like, pretty heavy stuff like Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, mm. J.R. Tolkien, Anne McCaffrey, like a little bit of sci-fi, a little bit of, of magic. And there was definitely an underlying magic to a lot of the stories. Maybe not so much like an actual magician, but like just where things, miracles would take place. And then, you know, you asked about childhood, like growing up, my parents, my mom came from a pretty religious household. Um, my dad, not, not so much. And my parents really got involved with the non-denominational Christian church. And so we would go at the church every Sunday. Mm. And then like Wednesday night was like Bible study or something. And then in the summer we had vacation Bible school and then started going to summer camp that was a Christian summer camp where 
some of my just most amazing time spent. But the thing that I think about looking back upon it is, is that on Sunday mornings or at summer camp, these stories that I would hear, like, you know, retelling stories from the from the Bible, for lack of a better term, that there were these just wonderful stories of hope and miracles. Mm. And and I remember like daydreaming about them. Like some of these, these like I'd hear a really good story on a Sunday morning and like being like in class in the week and like I'd find myself daydreaming about that story. Yeah. So that's that's what childhood was like. A lot of really wonderful good times being outdoors, playing, you know? And listening to stories yeah. and fantasizing about the stories yeah or? yeah i mean getting lost in them and then you know uh pretty active too like i was not like i was never like really athletic in, in school but i love like roller skating sledding in the winter you know bobsleds like just building things with my hands projects uh <laughs> that explains a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and, and my, my dad my dad's side of the family um very heavy engineering um even though my father was an engineer per se um whenever like my grandfather would come to visit or uncles or great uncles it was always like what's the weekend project what are we building what are we mm-hmm. what are we doing like very this old house like um mm-hmm. which was a show with bob vila back in the day <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know bob vila i don't know if i knew what that what was this old house is but um yeah so just create cre- and i was just like the, the idea of creating things yeah you know how would you say your family life was growing up i mean immediate family and then also i would even say like your extended family yeah, we were really, really close. My, both my parents had two sib- like for had two siblings, so and they were both the oldest uh, on both mm-hmm. sides with three, with three siblings. And actually, that's not fair. My my mom actually uh, has an adopted brother who was actually like a second or third cousin. So technically, I guess there'd be four. But um, when she was growing up, he was adopted. Once she was basically out of the house, so she mm-hmm. didn't really experience too much living with with him. So I sometimes I, I failed to include him in the story, but. Family life was, was really good. And I, I think the reason why I pause is because it's like there was almost like two different lives because this, so I grew up in the 80s, early 90s. I was born in 1980. And probably like around the age of like 12 or 13, um, like the AIDS, pand- AIDS epidemic pandemic was probably like what? Like we started hearing about a lot in the evening news in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm. And I remember being at like at church on a Sunday morning, hanging out in the fellowship hall, like playing around, running around. And whether it was in the fellowship hall or like that Sunday morning at some point, it was, I overheard it within the church and actually directly from the pulpit, from the, the, the preacher about AIDS and, and then about how it was a gay disease. And I didn't know what gay was, mm. but, I knew we didn't like them. Um, we knew, and I, and I heard that they were evil, and um, and I wouldn't say I would say the word was dirty, and and I was just like, oh wow, you know. And at some point, a year or two later, I was hanging out with some friends, and um, th- one of the kids had uh, like a, a Hustler magazine or something. And, and he had it. This, this is a PG show. <laughs> this is a PG show. But he had it. He had it hidden. Like he had it like hidden in the woods. And um, in the woods. Yeah. Like he he had like like in a box. Like they yeah, had like an, like just like underneath like uh, a, underneath the tree maybe like a fallen tree. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I remember he was like he's like do you, do you want a page you can take a page with you and and I was like and he ripped me like a little portion of it. And, um, and I remember the, the portion that he, that I asked him to rip me was like where there was like the 900 numbers on the back, which was like really dating myself. Mm-hmm. And they actually had pictures of men and women. And I specifically asked for the section that had the pictures of the one section that had the pictures of men on it as well, mm. too. You didn't see this coming. I know you're looking at me like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, but the point the of it was, the point of it was, is like, I realized I was like, I felt like very, like when I saw that, I was just like, you know, butterflies, pump, like sweat pump, like my hands, like we're all, you know, mm-hmm. and just all the feels, like, you know, all the feels. Yeah. And, and then I realized, I put two and two together and I was like, oh, this is what gay is. Oh. And that's why yeah. it's, I think that's why it's important for me to, to say that. And, and I remember coming home 
and and being at church again after having the realization that 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 I was what we talked about, mm-hmm. and I remember thinking that literally just from the feelings I had that I had AIDS. Wow. Yeah. And I and I after that church, I, I and I, when we got home from church, I ran upstairs and I as fast as I could to, to the bathroom and didn't say anything to my family. I kept was was quiet the whole way home, and I just I I showered probably for to the hot water ran out of the hot water tank. I just stood in the shower, just scrubbing and cleaning my body, thinking I was going to die of AIDS. Wow. And and from then on, like obviously education, and I you know I would listen, I, w- I would pay attention when people would talk about AIDS and, and realize that you know. I think that probably eventually I realized that, you know, I didn't have AIDS. I think there was a fear in me. Do you feel like any of that came, so that, so that misunderstanding of what that was, that came from, I mean, for lack of a better word, the hate that was being like taught about uh, gay people and AIDS from church. So it's almost like the stories that were being told from the pulpit were so, sort of the misguidance or the miseducation of what it really was. Or do you think it was, was it still at a point where it was still a little bit unknown of yeah. what that, what it really was? I mean, I think it would be, I think it would be fair to say it was a combination of both, mm. you know, um, yeah. probably not later on at this point, because it's been a two or three years later, you know, when I had that, you know, realization that we were, you know, the first time was in the late eighties when, you know, Ryan White, um, had contracted HIV from a blood transfusion who was also from Indiana as a boy. And, and there was a lot of unknown uh, of, of how and what was being, you know, what was taking place. But yeah, by, by probably the two or three years later, that it was, it was probably, there was definitely a lot more education out there about really what was causing it and how it was transmitted. But it was definitely the narrative that it was a gay disease hmm. that was, that you were destined to die of AIDS if you were gay. And, 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 and honestly, it was almost that it was deserved. Which is which is really interesting because I come we we had so much com- the, the culture that I came from was so much of love and compassion at home you mean well, your family at home can, in, in, in church, church? I mean, we, we would even do like we would do mission trips and even as a kid like I remember going to inner cities of St Louis and you know for a week in the summer and staying in a basement with cockroaches but we were there trying to help other people you know yeah. and so it was interesting to like how we would love on people but these people these people these were not people actually like these. As, as in gay people, right? Like queer people. That's what you're saying. I mean, it was like almost inhumane, like the way that you know it was referred to. You know, mm. how do you process that? It, I mean, if there's no one, like who did you go and talk to? Was there anybody that you oh. could talk to about? No, it? no. You, that was. I mean, it was a secret. I was going to, to take to, to my my grave. Mm. But you know, you, you 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 progress. You get older, and you know, I think by the age of sixteen and seventeen, when when you know, as you're in school and people start. Kids are smart. Kids are really smart. Like your your fellow, we're, we're observing each other. You know, you see a five. We see our nieces and nephews how smart they are. Yeah, and you see like in high school how how smart kids are watching and observing. And and I wasn't necessarily effeminate, but I was just very miserable. And, and I would say that just just fearful that fearful some, of fearful that, that someone would find out my secret. And that were you ever afraid then too that you would? I guess like part of my curiosity of this because I I never had this experience. So did you think that if you like, how did gay and AIDS relate in your mind? Like if you were to come out and say you're gay, would you get AIDS? Or did you feel like if you didn't tell anybody that AIDS wouldn't be an issue for you? Like you wouldn't get it even if you, you didn't say, or did that ever like work in that fashion? You know, I think that it was a dark cloud that hovered over AIDS was the idea of, of HIV or AIDS ho- hovered over me for, for a long time. Is that more just fear? Just, just fear. I mean, and, and, it's, and to be fair, is it like, I'm not HIV positive. I've dated people that, that, that have been in long-term relationships with people that, that have had, you know, HIV and then it's a different world today. Thank God. Well, you know? right. But yeah. um, I think that really the realization that was just to give you a better idea what was going on in my head yeah. was I observed how we thought about and what we believed about those people. Right. And I saw that what we, how we treated the people that came out. So I guess the question is why, so why are gay people, why are they so bad? Why are they so different? What's, what was it? What was the teaching? What would they say? The, the truth is, is that it was very much boogeyman talk. Mm-hmm. And that's a really good question because you it's it was like anything else where where fear is used it's like do you actually have you ever met a gay person have you really sat down and talked to a gay you know yeah and it was always um people would talk about it without actually 
knowing or you know it was yeah. this contempt prior to investigation kind of yeah, a thing you yeah. know so yeah it's like uh for me growing up there was always this fascination that i had with the storyline from the x-men comics and i think part of it was was i always knew myself that i was sort of this outcast sort of fighting against this world that didn't understand or didn't know us and really the crux of that whole story was that we're all human we're right. just a little bit different and yeah. until you, you let go of the fear and you really get to understand who i am as a person then there's really no need to fear then you just are and then you yes. either like me or don't like me right. as a person yeah. yeah 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 and it just seems like that just is a, a consistent story that we see or hear in churches today and also like I mean, just even on the show, like we've just had a lot of people that have gone through the right. similar experiences with some sort of religious foundation where they've had to, where it's been rocked because who they are doesn't line up with the the belief system yeah. of that church. Yeah. I think that to even expound upon that is, is that fear shows up. Um, like, you know, church is, is just a social structure, or a, not a social structure, but... It, it, well, oh, it yeah, really yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. It, 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 I mean, so as a society, we 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 figure out what what morals are acceptable, and and they continue to you know we talk about them, and we figure out oh this is not good, that, you know what is good or bad supposedly, trying to organize and create you know societies, mm -hmm. and in the church for a long time has served as that place where that takes place, you yeah. know. But I think though back to fear is is that what I have learned is is that like fear is what blocks is. If you want to talk about evil or or sin or whatever like to me really the the, the sin in, the, if you want to use the word sin or missing the mark is like fear is what really blocks me from from source god creativity creativity exactly right yeah. like it literally and and so i don't think that so and, and honestly like we'll talk about a little bit this more about like where i'm at today with life and how we've gotten to where we are today but it's allowed me to understand the fact that that yeah i had a lot of fear growing up as a kid but I'm not the only one, right? Like right. there's no, they did it, it shows up in every, in, in, in all of our lives. Yeah. What I think blocks us from maybe like achieving our destiny versus like fate um, and stuff like that. But, um, but I don't have any, any, any power over. So I think what we're talking about all this is just to understand the fact that like, I needed an overhaul of my thoughts, right? you know? And, and, and so I absorbed, you know, a lot of really good stuff when I was younger. And then um, I tried to come out or I was actually kind of outed by a couple of different people. And my parents asked me once or twice and, and I denied it because I, I knew how we talked about those kind of people. And what happened was I actually, I discovered alcohol, like probably like my senior year of high school. Mm. And what happened was, is it, it kind of hit the pause button on this whole uncomfortable feeling I'd have been having the last three or four years. And it gave me, it gave me an escape from, all the negative thoughts and kind of made me feel empowered. And, mm -hmm. and I'll say, honestly, I think it, it probably saved my life for a while. Um, Cause I, I don't know if I would have been able to live through some of the things I lived through. I, I threw a party when my parents were going out, were out of town and um, <laughs> the, the police showed up and uh, I got an underage drinking ticket, which I was, you know, obviously on my, on, on my, my shoulders. And part of that was, is I had to go to, um, to counseling for, for, for part of whatever the juvenile justice system. And somehow like, I think you could choose the counselor and my parents found a counselor that specifically catered to alcohol and also uh, restorative therapy for for homosexuals. And so that's uh, so like conversion therapy. Yeah, conversion therapy. And mm. and you know, and I just kind of went along with it because I it was like as long as I was checking the boxes, it was like nobody bothered me. Everything was okay. Mm -hmm. And and so I went along with that. And you didn't fight the system, and no. then you weren't pushing the envelope of no, who you were. No. You weren't exploring it. Plus, you didn't have the words, right? Right. I mean, at that point, you didn't have the language, and uh, not only the language, but you there's no support system for you. It sounds like right. at this point, right? And there wasn't. Yeah. You, you didn't dare say like there was whispers and rumors of of you know like maybe the the, the swim coach or one other person in my high school. And I went to a big high school. It was like four thousand people, you know, at the time. And I was dating a a girl actually, and her cousin had family in Chicago. Her mom had gotten divorced and, and was living in, in Boys Town in Chicago. Mm. And so one way her mom was living in Boys Town? Her, uh, yeah, the one girl's mom was living yeah. in Boys Town. Okay. Had, had divorced, had, had, had kind of a... That's a great place to yeah. go after and, a divorce. And, yeah, right. And so, she, <laughs> and so we went, and so one weekend, she's like, oh, we can go, we can go visit my mom. And 
she's very much a free spirit and and um and I didn't know like I yeah. just knew we were going to go to Chicago and and we got there and we arrived and took a probably a taxi from the train from downtown from the South Shore train from South Bend and we we get up to Boys Town you know and, and they've got the pillars that have been erected that you with know with rainbows. rainbows and I was just like oh and I saw you heard the music I heard the you music. saw the go-go dancers in the windows yeah yeah, yeah. it was just like seriously like um like when Roger Rabbit walks into Toontown <laughs> and, it, and everything becomes alive with all the colors <laughs> or a little kid runs downstairs on Christmas day yeah right right <laughs> yeah. but everything was just so alive and vibrant and I was yeah. just like it and, and to be fair there was like I, I think it's such a beautiful place now but there was this curiosity, but also like this internalized homophobia that was, there was two tracks playing in my oh, head. Oh, so right? it's kind of like a dirty place too. Yeah. It was yeah. like, it was like, oh my gosh. But then the back of my mind was just like, these are horrible. These are, this is what you've been hearing about. These are uh, the gay, like, this is yeah. like Mecca yeah, for yeah. where all these, these horrible people are. Hmm. You said compartmentalize after we were there for the weekend, I found myself then sneaking off on the weekends and going there by myself. Oh, so you would go. Oh, I would go yeah, by myself. Yeah, because you needed to, you needed to experience. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and that's when I think, honestly, I think my mental health then really went went out the window. In a bad way. In a bad you way, couldn't, yeah. You yeah, couldn't it, handle it? I just couldn't. I, I, it, it, was, it was becoming too much for me to compartmentalize. Was it like living two different lives? Completely, yeah, mm. completely. I remember I, I was, I, I, at some point was, had to go to a psychologist and, and uh, he was like, oh, he's like, you know, you're Pinocchio going to the island of, you know, and, and, oh. and it was just like, you know, and I, I was just in such a hard spot. Well, you, it's hard to live that yeah. dual life. Yeah. It's just really hard. And I feel like so many people for so long, you know, that's what they had to do. I think like think back like to people who were like 40s, 50s, 60s, right? In like living in those times, even in the 70s. I mean, even people today still live dual lives. But it's like that mental, the mental capacity to keep up, to be able to, uh, when you're, you know, with your family, to not switch to not code switch to not to slip up you know yeah. to say something that you shouldn't say that would incriminate you yeah. for being you know doing something that you're not supposed to do that, and i uh, that alone i mean it, it's just a, i yeah. mean my eyes are fluttering right now yeah. just thinking about all of the effort and the work that goes into yeah. to doing that and yeah. it's also living a lie well, and that's you 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 nailed it right there is is that for, for any of us, it mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, for any of us, if we're not living in our truth, so, we have so much energy. And we, maybe when you're in it, you don't realize it, but once you've been able to step away from that or, or to, you know, kind of do an overhaul of your life and to live in, in truth, that is just burning up constant energy of your yeah. soul and your spirit. And you, even when you're sleeping, it's yeah. just this, this constant thing. Well, and it shows up in ever in other places too. Uh, yeah. It shows up in like your your health. Yeah. You like things start happening where your body degenerates. Right. Right. Your work is not going to be great. Your social yeah. life is not going to. It, it just affects. You're, you're everything. second guessing everything you say. It, and you know, so it, I love that we're talking about this for a minute because back to my my, my grandfather, my, my dad's side of the family being engineers. So my dad's dad um, was a civil engineer and he designed bridges for the state of Ohio. And then his father. I don't exactly remember exactly what he did, but he very much building and stuff like that. And I remember my dad telling me that when he would go visit, we called him Grandpa Mike, that so my dad's family, everybody, and actually even in my, in my immediate family, everybody besides myself is left-handed. Mm. So my dad, my mom is left-handed, my brother's right-handed, my dad's left-handed, and then also on my dad's side, um, everybody was left-handed, which back for, 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 I don't know, for, for many, many years in the church, it was, and even in society, that that was lesser than uh, yeah lesser than or a, a, a sign of, of of bad character, and so my dad would tell me that when he would go to visit. So my dad's like I don't know in his twenties or eight, upper teens. His his grandfather was probably in his seventies. That he said I remember I would watch him at the tool bench when they would be, uh, my dad would be building something with him. Mm -hmm. He would go to reach for something. His left hand would go first, and then he would stop and then go with the right hand. Like to stop himself, huh? Like that innate thing, and it, yeah. and it's like his whole life, like that just, he he was taught no, you can't use your left hand, and he yeah. would just stop, and then and I and I, I got to think like that's not healthy. Well, no, and I mean for you in this situation, you can't be who you are, so you're going to right. like you're experiencing life, yeah. you're feeling like normal things that 16, 17, yeah. 18 year old kids feel, right? And you can't 
act, so instead of being able to act on what you're feeling, you're going the opposite yeah, direction. Your, your intuition, just, instinct, whatever you choose uh, to call it. Yeah. And, and, and it's and it's it's great. Like you know, like my, you know, my brother's left handed, and no one ever scorned him. You know, like mm-hmm. with with the things that he did, and he played the trumpet, and they didn't say, "Oh, you got to do it with you know one hand versus the other." But when I learned to tie my shoes, I remember it was a big deal. My mom's father. Who, we were living in Indiana or Michigan at the time, and he, and he was coming to visit from Arizona where my mom's parents lived. And he was the only right-handed person. Uh, and so it was such a big deal for a right-handed person to teach me how to tie my shoes. Yeah. Like it, they were saving for him. And, and so but the point is, is that we had gotten to the point where we, it was celebrated to be left-handed, you know? Right. Like it's just, just as much as like, you know, there's redheads and, you know, blondes and brunettes, you know, sort of a thing. And you were out of a family of left-handed, you were the only right-handed one. I was the only one. right-handed one, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting how yeah, that works. Right. You obviously had some, I don't want to know, I don't know if the right word is trauma, but uh, in coming out, it was not an easy process. When you were finally able to accept who you are and you were able to let your family know what, happened you know after i had had that conversion therapy and i was going to college at uh in, in south bend and um i was actually living with my parents in my freshman year and i came home one night and my dad was still up which was bizarre because he doesn't usually stay he's more of an early riser and, and i remember um I had had a little bit to drink and didn't really think too much of it and i logged on the computer this was back in the day like you know when you had one computer in the whole house and <laughs> and, and and i didn't you know i didn't really pay him too much attention and, and i logged on and and um what had been waiting up for me i came to find out and he just said to me he said you know he said you know if he just said a couple words and he said you know if this this is still a problem and what this would do to our family Mm. And and right about the same time, my, my mom had uh, was going had, had had cancer, and I think her cancer may have been back, or was you know, I, it's kind of foggy. And I just remember sitting there and being like, "I've got to get out of here." And we'll talk about this more. Like my dad and I have a very wonderful relationship now, but that was I knew that this, the cat was back out of the bag again, and I had to um, yeah. to, to get out. And, and I and I did end up getting an apartment not too far, and, and went to school for a little bit longer. It was also like working a job uh, and it just the thing was my emotion my mental state was just a mess of course and, yeah so i dropped out of college and um and i do what most people do i i uh <laughs> i ran down to, to to south florida for spring break and kind of never came back <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean it's not horrible <laughs> I, I went i went down to fort lauderdale with 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 a dear friend who um who has been there through some through so many things in life for me and he was a little bit older than me he's like oh we should you know go down there together and i just had so i had such a great time and so i packed up everything and moved down to, to down to F- south florida and uh, and i remember specifically fort lauderdale, fort lauderdale Miami. Miami. yeah fort yeah. lauderdale at the time and, and i think it's important to, to, to say this from a place of understanding of where they were at then versus where they're at now is that i have a family friend who's like a sister to me and and i remember she being like yeah like at church last week like when they were doing prayer requests, there was a prayer that Jeff had moved down to South Florida to pr- pursue a gay lifestyle. And and we didn't really talk for, my family, I really didn't talk for that next year. Mm. Uh, and that was, and I just want to explain like that that was really, really hard. Yeah. And I think it was, I mean, and, I, and the thing is, is I don't want to discount the fact that it was hard for me and I know, and I know it was hard for them. And I know that at that time they truly believed that they, they believed at that point that that they had to save my soul in this lifetime so that we could be together like in eternity, like in heaven per se, mm-hmm. right? And so like that was, it was, they, they couldn't worry about the now, they were worried about like the the forever at that point. I mean, that, mm-hmm. was, that was their belief, you know, at the time. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, down there and, and you know, and, and I, so I had a lot of internalized homophobia, but yet that's where there was a lot of gay people and you could be free. Yeah. You don't have to worry about covering your your rear end, so to speak. You're yeah. not like you're not lying anymore. You could just be who you are. Yeah. Which had to take almost I mean, I could just feel like I don't know. I could just like imagine that feeling of like this weight being lifted oh. off your shoulders. I almost I could just see been to Fort Lauderdale a few times in my life and being <laughs> like I could just see in Wilton Manors just being able to like it's almost like you could take a breath yeah. of fresh air. Yeah, so. yeah, and I, and I would, and I did. I, I lived down in South Beach for a while, like like back before it was as well known as it was, and it was just a beautiful. It was really neat because also, like, I grew up in Indiana, 
in Michigan with not too much diversity. And, and I like, I started making friends with Cubans and, yeah. and, and I had Jewish friends for the first time in my life. And mm-hmm. I was experiencing yeah. diversity and just hearing different stories and yeah. like going out to dinner, like in having sushi, <laughs> like things I had just silly things I'd never done before. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and there was a lot of like wonderful experiences, but I also like, I still wasn't, I will say is that when I moved down there, it was like, there was a sense of like, I didn't know who I was and I, I threw away everything I had. To, I, I let go of all the good and all the bad I had been taught. Yeah. I let go of everything. Yeah. And so almost like there was like no moral compass. Oh, Does that make any sense? Yeah. And so like I, I constantly, um, and there was a lot of like, not a lot of, I didn't have a lot of dignity for myself in that process as well sure. too. Uh, so time and time again, I, I, and part of it, honestly, like there's just like, part of it's just like, you know, being a teenager in your twenties. Well, right. Right. Like discovering like, yourself, discovering yourself. Yeah. And, um, and I really feel like I was looked after like from something, there was something, bigger than me looking out through a lot of some crazy things that, you know, that I I went through. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting for, so you said this about your family, you know, that I feel like we don't talk about this as much, uh, is that not us, but it's just not talked about as much is that for as hard as this whole transition was for you, because you, you had to leave, like there was no, oh, you, yeah. you, you, you had to get out of your immediate surrounding to be able to start understanding who you were. Yeah. But that's also very hard to leave everything behind, to leave your family, to not be able to talk to them. I mean, that's a lot of, even though there's like this weight lifted off your shoulder and you could be yourself, yeah. you're really giving up everything you've ever known. So, uh, but I also think too, what's really, what we don't talk about as much is how hard it is for a family, especially your family at that time, being in the surrounding and the community, when I say community, I mean the church that they belong to, but being with those people. And it's funny, I just called the church people, those people and the church people call the gay people, those people. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny it's how that just worked. There. Yeah. It's yeah. true. Um, but how you're, you know, it's hard for parents too. It's hard for families too, that are go that are in a not affirming or a not a welcoming, you know, mm-hmm. community that it's, everybody kind of goes through yeah. a little bit of something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and then there was that unknown. So like, yeah. you know, that, that, that whole thing of I've unknown. And, and I think that that's why it's really important for, to not let other people tell your story. Yeah. That is uh, something that also I try to um, lean into when I, when I have fear or, or I witness that somebody else is telling somebody else's story that I have not had an experience with, mm-hmm. whether it's a, a belief or a custom, you know, because that, what that does is that takes that humanity out of the, 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 the person, right? Mm-hmm. We live in, an, especially here in the United States, such a, a, a culture that's built, built on marketing. And that marketing is a, is a form of story, storytelling. There was a, some research that came out uh, this past year, in the last couple of months, and it was uh, with Google Analytics, basically. And it was on tra- the word for transgender on social media. Mm-hmm. And 80, I want to say like 80%, maybe like 78% was all in negative context, mm. right? So the story, so, so 78% of, you know, is it like less than 20% of people say they know someone who's trans, yeah. right? And then, so then if your experiences from social media and it's groups that are against trans people mm-hmm. and, and, and your experience is is being told to the lens in a negative context, yeah. then that's your experience with with said said person, right? right? Well, that's why it's all of our responsibility. Right. Everyone who is pro transgender folks that when pro humanity, well, <laughs> correct. But I'm just saying yeah. in this example that when you see something or there's news or there's something positive to share, you have to share it. Yeah. You especially on social media, you have to be able to share that because, you know. A couple of weeks ago, I know that there were some things, some of the bills in some of the states that had passed. And uh, I know that it was, it's important to me to be able to use my own personal platform to be able to share because then there are people who are connected to me who maybe are in that, you know, 80% that maybe don't say negative things, but don't know a trans person right, yeah. or they don't know. But then if they, they start connecting the dots, Oh well, 
I love you as in me, yes. right? That they love me and that they're seeing that I'm advocating right. for another group or helping right. elevate that voice. Right. That's then there's at least the beginning of a, a bridge being built there. Well, and I think the other thing is, is that you're esteemed in your, in a lot of things in life, Yeah, you know? And so it's like, okay, well, if knowing who you are, mm -hmm. that generally speaking, you, you have a good heart and a good moral compass on things. Well, how is it that, that, you know, that Anthony, could, right. right. So it's like, but maybe, maybe then I might be like, you know, quietly from the sidelines being yeah. like, curious and being able to, you know, do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, observing. You yeah. Know? Well, and if you look at like the queer movement, you know, it goes, it's gone in phases where it, it just takes time, but the more people get to know people within the community, yeah. it helps break down some of those yeah. barriers. Yeah. So you were in Florida, you're living down there. You start, obviously you have to start working because, mm -hmm. you know, bills yeah. got to get paid. Food's got to yeah. get made on gotta the table. Got to pay for those nights out in Wilton Manors. Yeah. Right, those vodka tonics. <laughs> yeah. um, so <laughs> what, what did you find yourself doing for work? So I, I actually found myself at first as a lifeguard down there, which was fun because I had lifeguarded in the summers. <laughs> yeah, just I'm hold. laughing because I never knew that. <laughs> you didn't know that? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, but anyway, so. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, I, um, I wasn't making a ton of money doing that. If you could get a job working for the city, you could actually make pretty decent bank. But uh, I always ended up like working at a country club or a private beach area. I had a friend who was working for, I had a friend of a friend, I was dating, dating this guy and he had a friend that was working for Gucci and mm -hmm. he was working at this place called Ball Harbor, which is uh, between like, it's like North Miami, uh, North Miami Beach. And uh, there's a lot, there's a lot more choices now in Miami, but at the time, like that was the place for high-end fashion. Right. It's like the, would have been like the Rodeo Drive, you know, little quiz uh, note is, is that it was the first ever Neiman Marcus that was opened outside of the state of Texas oh. uh, by Stanley Marcus. Huh. And um, so I was like, I heard just stories about like, there was a lot of like gay guys that were, and, and women that, queer people that were working uh, in the fashion industry uh, up there, it was you could take the bus from South Beach and be up there. And I was like, well, I mean, they were making like, just to give you guys, they, they were making like six figures. And this was in the like 2000s. Yeah. You know? And, and you're like 22, 23. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Like, so you're like, okay. I'm like, that's like more money than I'm making, you know, yeah. here sitting on the beach, which was fun. But uh, so anyway, nice so I, tan. yeah, nice tan. And um, so I went and I found that, so Neva Marcus was, was hiring for uh, men's furnishings. Oh. And furnishings yeah. as in well that's exit so that's, that's that, that was <laughs> so i showed up in um you know in, in my best uh structure express suit or whatever it was and, whatever you were able to get yeah, your hands on and um and i i and he interviewed and I, I passed the test and then they they called the hr person uh invited the manager to come up and or maybe had me come back like a week later and it, long story short she her name was Marsha Painter and she was just a lovely human being and um she's like well she called me Jeffrey which kind of just I don't know made me feel good because my grandmother would always call me that and but she was <laughs> much younger um and she said she's like well Jeffrey she's like uh, we, we see all these things you know you've done da, 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 da. she's like what, what makes you want to work in men's furnishings? And I was like, well, my parents, well, we, we, would, we, would, we, we would move around often and it was always a big deal to go to the furniture store and, and I always went with them to help pick out the furniture. And she just let me tell my story and she smiled and she's like, you know what? She's like, you're honest. She's like, and you're a hard worker. She's like, so we can teach you. <laughs> so men's furnishings to those listening, um, that would be like a tie, like cufflinks, yeah, um, cummerbunds, ties, a sweet boy from Indiana, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, jewelry, all that, yeah. you know, stuff that. Uh, so anyway, so the point was, is that she took a chance on me, yeah, and and they and at that back then they would really they they would give you like a week of education, right? They would really pour into you, and yeah. so like they taught me the art. I went through a class of the art of selling, mm. customer service, and then and I learned about all these designers from Italy. Yeah, and, and, it, and I loved it. Like it was really interesting, and and what it did was it, I got the job, and I was working on the first floor, which was the entrance into this luxury mall, and like Missy Elliott would be come walking by one day, or you right. know, like I got to help uh, Farewell Williams one time, and and it was just it was a really good eye opening cultural experience. Sure, and it also taught me that I could do like I could like this small kid for this kid from Indiana, yeah, 
could, could I, that I could swing it with some of these. And you were making like, I mean, you're selling suits that were like five, ten thousand dollars. Right. Was, it was commission. Right. And you're not you're even, like, th- and, the, and p- the people that are buying right. aren't even, you know, right. blinking an eye. And it, I guess, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but I can imagine coming from where you came from, like nobody bought ten thousand oh, dollars suits gosh. in your house, right? right? So it's like being able to. Experience just experiencing that it it just opens your eyes to a different level of I don't want to say living, but just a different. It, there's a lot of lessons that can be right. learned when you work in high end sales. Well, and, and and right, and it wasn't just about the, the the. And I'm glad you said that. It wasn't just about the money. It was we would have we would have like designers from New York the, from trunk shows, and we would have to be there you know an, an hour early before the store would open, and I would be sitting there getting a lecture you know from something from women's upstairs couture to you know runway stuff from Paris that they were bringing in, and and they told us they're like you don't ever you don't. You don't think with your money, right? So they would. So that was really good to break those glass ceilings, right? right? Because where I was in the furnishings department, every, if, if you developed a relationship with a customer that yeah. became your client, then you were allowed to take them throughout the store. Yeah. And so you know you could partner up with another sales associate, and um and I and I watched some of these guys have been doing this for fifty, you know, probably for thirty years that were in their fifties or sixties, and they didn't stop till the customer told them to stop. Right. You never stop showing them things. You know, it's like, oh, well, here's the alligator belt and the alligator shoes that go. I'm just like, well, yeah. this guy just spent ten thousand dollars on a suit. Now you're showing him, you know, fifteen thousand dollars worth of accessories. And right. it was very interesting. There's also, I feel like, I mean, I myself I've had experiences working in higher end, you know, places and doing higher end sales. And I think another lesson that you get with money through a lot of that training is that money is, it's, you know, so many people, we get money and we want to hold on to it Mm -hmm. and we want to, you know, clench our fists. And I'm guilty of it. There's times in my life where I've been in that position where it's like it comes in and I just want to hold on to it and not use it. But when you learn that money is more of a a tool and it allows for you to pay you know, for things to happen, right. it really just changes your whole mentality. Yeah. I remember uh, this was, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago, I was doing an event for this client and it was uh, the mother of the bride and we were doing stuff and somebody said something to her, like, we can do everything that you are asking for. It's going to cost mm-hmm. a significant more. And her response was, I don't give a shit. It's just money. I'm going it, to, it, it doesn't matter. We'll, it, we're going to use it. It's going to go and it's going to come back and it's going to go out again. Mm-hmm. It's just a cycle. Mm-hmm. And I remember learning learn or hearing that thinking once you can shift your mind yeah. around the power of yes. what money is right. and how you can do that, then you are able to then really use it as a vehicle to yeah. get you to to do the things. So I should also just say this is that it's not just to like go buy a car or a watch or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's to use it as a vehicle to get you to where you're mm-hmm. supposed to be next to be able to continue to follow your destiny. Yeah. 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 I would completely, and I mean, we, we can talk about instincts in a little bit. The, it, it taught me so much. Like, there was just so many amazing lessons I learned there. Like, like the ones you're talking about as well. And, and I think it's important just to point out is it, is that that was an amazing job. And I basically like threw it all away. And, and I had a couple of different jobs down there where I would be really good and then like just like my my mental health mm. would just like these thoughts I had about myself and just and it was this internalized homophobia where I would just destroy my life. Mm. I would build it back up again and it was like building a tower like a Django tower and I would just knock it back down to the ground. Cycle. Just the cycles of just just self loathing. And then people would always cheer. And I, I had so many wonderful people in my life that would just be cheering for me. And then I would just do it to myself again. It's, it's like self-destruction. Yeah, self-destruction. Very unhealthy yeah. you know, unhealthy behavior. And so what happened was eventually I was like, I, I decided that after two or three bouts down there with just, just experiences that I, I, that I decided that, I remember my mom, I, my mom was, was talking to me then at that point, And she was just like, you know what, Jeff? She's like, maybe at some point you're going to realize that it's not just bad luck. Because I was always like blaming. I, I was never... It was always somebody oh, else's fault. Oh, you weren't owning oh, up to it. Was it was always somebody else's yeah, fault, you were, right? I, yeah, because because if if I did, that would put that would put a chink in the narrative that I was telling myself, right? Yeah, and, and to be fair, like I was hurting, like I was definitely sure. hurting. But how many times? I mean, I like I know for myself, and you hear it with like other people too. It's like when 
the more you blame, if it's everyone else's fault for something that's going wrong in your life and you never own up to the part that is your fault, right. it's never going to change. Right. The right. cycle's never going to change. Right. Yeah. It's just important to be able to identify that. And it, like your right. mom, I know your mom, so I'm you know a little biased here, but like it's almost like that voice of that mom voice that just like comes through right. that voice of reason that like yeah. you know sets that off in your head that right. had to be. I'm guessing that was helpful for you at you know, this point. You know, I I think I I think I uh, I, I want to say that I almost put it in the filing cabinet and didn't mm-hmm. quite hear it. Like I just was like, ah. But, it, but but the thing was, my mom my mom is generally like the biggest cheerleader. Yeah, and that's why like when I came out and stuff like that, like it was just it was just she, she became a different person for a while. Yeah. And um and rightfully so if right, she's right, wanting to protect your soul. Right, 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 right exactly. Yeah. And and I and that's like I, I kind of like want to be careful not to tell too much of her story because she has an amazing story. Point is is that I so I did a geographic. I, I um, You had to leave. I yeah, because yeah. I, I said I said, you know, I was was going back I lived in Miami for a while, then I would go to Fort Lauderdale. It was this back and forth tango. And and so then I finally was like, Oh, South Florida's a problem. Mm. Right. And so my, I called my brother and I was in a bit of a bind. I was in a bit of a spot. He got on the, he got on the next plane down and came down and really helped me. We packed up my car and, and we, we came up North and, and lo and behold, I was like, you know, I, I took a couple, a couple of weeks off and like crashed at a friend's house. And I ended up, I was like, all right, I'm like, I'm either going to live in Indianapolis or Chicago because I knew that I was making good, decent money in the fashion industry. And I had to be in a big enough city where there was a large enough economy to support the kind of wares I was selling. Yeah, that and, makes sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I landed in, um, I was offered a job at Indianapolis working for one of the companies I'd worked for. And then I was offered, offered a job in Chicago as well, too. I uh, went to work for uh, this Italian fashion house. Um, <laughs> this <laughs> little Italian yeah, fashion this little, house. That, so that it actually had a movie that came out about the same time as, as I was taking the job in Chicago working for them um, called The Devil Wears Prada. So everyone would come into the store and ask about the movie. But um, yeah, so I get this, I get <laughs> this, funny. I get this wonderful opportunity to go and, and, and it was salary. It was salary plus commission. I remember yeah. thinking um, when I signed the contract, I was like, this is the kind of money that like people in my family that are highly regarded are making. And yeah, so, you know, I, it was, it was interesting. And I remember like, like, like a week or two after being there, there was like nine of us that worked in the, in the boutique together. And a couple of the girls were like, Hey, um, we're going to take you out. Um, you're new to the city. We're going to show you. <laughs> and, um, and so it was like a Sunday evening and we, we finished up work at six o'clock and it was, um, it was time to, to, to go out. And they're like, we're going to go to, uh, this place right around the corner. And it was called Lake Colonial. And we walked upstairs to this beautiful, just that there was, it was candlelit and there was palm trees. It was like French colonial design. It was like right out of a movie. And, um, and we, we watched our way up to the bar and there was this guy who had the, like, just, he was entertaining. He was like, he was on stage and he was just like, the laughter was carrying on. And he was almost like the conductor of the laughter. And it was just, you wanted to be there. You wanted to be sitting on the bar, like front row to what was taking place. And eventually like, it was like he was entertaining five people at once. It was really a, quite an amazing. I, I, I know talent when I see it, and, um, <laughs> and, and and it was talent. And and enter you. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> there I was. Yeah. So behind that bar. Behind that bar. Slinging drinks, building a business on the front yeah. uh, during the day, and slinging drinks at night. Yeah. So you were you were starting your your company. Yeah. You and and. and uh, and Need to pay some bills. Paying some bills there on the side, doing a side hustle there. Yeah. I had an amazing time with you there that evening and with a couple of my colleagues. And then we left. I think uh, you, for some reason you overheard that you thought I worked at Hermes or Barney's. Uh, Barney's. Barney's. Yeah. And so I spent a month going to Barney's every day. I think it was like <laughs> looking for you. It was, like, it was a month. It okay. was three weeks. Well, a month is four weeks. <laughs> Just, We're not, just, I'm not that far off. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, three weeks later I, I bounced back in and, um, after I, cause I was just getting adjusted to like moving into the city and life. stuff, life, right. Getting to this and then you and I connected and I would say that what I felt like I was feeling was what people would talk about in the movies as love. Mm. And I was like, this is what other people get to have. This yeah. is what other people describe. And it was like there was a ride that was pulling up that was like, come on, you got to get on. You, not you got to get on, but like you, you can, 
you this is mm-hmm. this is waiting for you yeah and and um and i um i think uh i told myself that for that winter that i could get on that ride mm-hmm. you know um for a while and i had you and i had um an amazing time together for 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 that season for a while for a while <laughs> right and then and then something happened where those thoughts these thoughts i had in my head of like how this 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 is not this is not allowed this is not you know these these things that you know really what it was it was like there was just this internalized self hatred of myself yeah. that i hadn't healed yet yeah and, and 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 i and something told me there was this voice in my head that cuz like i had honestly like i had been not exactly the best people, the best person, other people I had dated previously. Like I had been in unhealthy relationships and, and something told me that leave this one alone, mm. like leave him alone. And I remember one night we were out and, um, and I also had started using substances again because I was in so much pain. Yeah. And it was like, I just wanted to be numb and block every feeling out of my life. Cause I was yeah. in so much pain that I just remember telling you to, you know, that I, I, I didn't love you and I couldn't be with you and to push you out of my life. And, you know, and, and then from, from then on, like for the next seven years, my life was just like from one disaster to another. Yeah. And for, for and, and it's, and it's hard to believe that it was seven years. It was seven years. And it was just like the incomprehensible, like demoralization of like, just like the bottom, like when you think your life can't get lower, it would just get lower. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't, I was so stubborn that I could never be able to, to look to the fact that, that maybe I was the one. Right. Right. Like um, that I was the one making these, I was always somebody else's fault. Yeah. And so eventually, you know, I, I, uh, I had this, this moment where I was like, I can't, I can't live. Yeah, no, I, that's why I was going to ask. What's your, what was the moment? What happened? I, I kind of had like this, this experience, like this spiritual, I mean, not, not kind of, it was, it was a spiritual experience where, where I had like this, this just experience where it was like, you cannot do this anymore. Yeah. And, but I didn't know how I wasn't going to do this anymore. Yeah. But I think part of the thing sometimes is that you just have to know that you need to change. Right. right. Once that's, I think 50% of the work is once you understand that, uh, that something needs to give, something needs to shift, something needs to change. Surrender. All you have to do is once you say, I'm okay, okay, here it is. I'm ready to change things then start showing up yeah. to help guide yeah. the shift because it can't all happen at once. Right. You can't just all of a sudden go from rock bottom to live in large. Like it just doesn't work that way. I mean, and nothing works that way. Yeah. Anything, uh, uh, relationships don't work that way. Opening a business doesn't work that nothing works that You're way. Right. There's a lot of work that goes into, you know, rebuilding. But the first step is being able to say is to surrender and to say, I need help and I need to change. Yeah, yeah, and, and then that's and that's what took place. Once I, I had that experience, it was like all of a sudden it was just like something told me like to reach out to to this person that I knew. I didn't know why, but I reached out to him and you know and he pointed me into the right direction to get some help. And that was like the, everything from then on. Yeah, like kind of like that surrender, like yeah. you know, like just like I don't know what just do the next right thing, like, you know, and, and, and you know what it was? It was like, I was no longer like, I don't know, I'm 32 years old at this point. It's just like Jeff Miller incorporated has been a failure. Yeah. You know, right. Like, yeah. So got to declare bankruptcy yeah, exactly. and start all over. Right. And, and yeah. I couldn't, couldn't blame anybody else but myself right. at that point. And, you know, and I mean, that, sorry, I, I don't mean that you personally declared bankruptcy. I'm just like, no, as, I mean, a, as a, pretty much. <laughs> If well, anybody, if anybody would have given me any credit at that point, I would have. But yeah, but yeah, um, no. So now you are. So now you go through this experience, yeah. and now you find yourself back in Michigan. Yeah, yep. and <laughs> from uh, men's fashion, or high end men's fashion, and women's fashion, and I, women. Yeah, sorry, yes. I forgot you did both. To back to Michigan on a farm. Yeah. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I befriended uh, a friend who had been in politics and he had been a farmer and he had been away from his farm for a while as a politician. And we were both two souls that the universe placed in each other's lives. And um, we both served a very significant role in each other's lives at a pivotal time for the next few years. He um, he had been away, and 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 I would come and help him out. We we were we became buddies, and I was hanging out more and more on the farm with him in Michigan. And it just became a kind of apparent. It was like when I was kind of staying in the city, I was still staying in Chicago from time, you know. 
And um, I couldn't really afford my, you know, the little studio I had. And, and so he was like, you know what, why don't you just, he's got this, you know, this big six bedroom farmhouse living there by himself. He's like, and I was staying upstairs and he's like, his bedroom was on the first. Yeah. Floor. He was on the first floor. There yeah. was four, but no one had been upstairs for 20 years. Right. You know, that was a house he had grown up in as a kid. And, and, um, and it was like right out of a movie again, like it was just, it was just, it had been untouched for probably 30 years. Mm-hmm. So I, I started cleaning that up. And, and that was the thing was like, now that, now that like, now that I was looking to like get help and it was like, I had this clear head and it was like, all of a sudden I had all of this time. Mm. Because all of those thoughts that had been occupying, it was like now that va- there was this vacuum of space. Yeah. And so there, it was a vineyard, um, it was a Welch's grape juice vineyard and also for, for wineries and well in Southwest Michigan. And, and since he had been away for six years, things had kind of had gotten, I don't want to say like, they just hadn't been up to the same standard. Right. And, and so we spent the next couple of years just like rebuilding that farm. Mm. And it was just so, it was, I got well there is what I would say. Like I got healthy there. I spent a lot of time in quiet with nature, just hours. I would be sometimes for 12 hours in the, the, up in the vineyards, like on the tractors. Yeah. And just like a lot of time, like with listening to like, whether it was podcasts or other people that had, you know, gotten, gotten, you know, better from some of the things I was suffering from. And, and then also service. Like I started help, like immediately started helping other people. And that has been something that like, I have found that sometimes that when fear crops into my life is that to help another person has been something that continues to get me back to where I need to be. So what happened was, is that like a few years after being there, I, I had a couple other job opportunities, but I had a whisper that just told me that I needed to be at the farm full time. And it said, and I was like, ah, oh, because the farm wasn't paying me a ton of money. I was like, God, like universe, like how is this going to work? And it was just like, just trust me, you need to be there full time. And literally like a few months after that, we found out um, that my dear friend, the, the farmer, my friend Neil, that he had cancer. Mm-hmm. And, and looking back upon it, it was like, it, I was going to need to be there full time. And, and um, this, this guy who had like helped me like love me before I could love myself, who built confidence when, when we would be out in the field and like a tractor, a tractor would break down, he'd, he would be like, you can do it. I'm like, well, I don't know how to do this. He's like, if I can do this, you can do this. And what I learned there was self-esteem. I learned about how to use my mind mm-hmm. to, to figure out the problem solve mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. right, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. and to be a self-starter. Um, there were so many lessons that were learned there that I could probably write a whole book on. And I also- Which got, you should. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and there was things that I observed that I had never as a kid- like for instance, like the intricate nature in, of, of plants, like we had a soybean and cornfield and he would say to me, you know, oh, we have to get the soybeans plant. Like I, he would triage. He's like, Jeff, we have to get that. I'm like, well, why don't we do this today? He's like, no, he's like, we have to, we have to do this because if we don't get this done, it was like, he was conducting the whole thing with all it's the project thing. management, project management. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, if we don't get the, this crop planted by such and such date, we're not going to be able to have crop insurance. I was like, well, why not? He's like, well, because after June 21st, the days start to get shorter. And mm. if the plant has not grown up by June 21st, it knows as the days start getting shorter to stop growing and to push out the pod. Oh. Right. So if it only gets to be two feet tall, yeah. you're only going to have a foot and a half worth of pods. Yeah. But if it gets to be three and a half feet tall, there'll be more space for it to, and it, just to know that it knows. Yeah. Right. And so, like, there was something with me also, I was like, wait a minute, like, to understand, like, these things I had been fighting in myself about who I was mm-hmm. that were like innate, you know, of who and about my being, I was like, these are all like, these are things that want to express themselves that won't go away, that are right. who I am. And, and when I started leaning into that and actually like trusting people and going from like switching pronouns when I was dating somebody to, to like the same sex mm. and like leaning into like it was just these little baby steps of like working through fear and getting well. And, you know, he, he was an, just, I've, there's few people in my life that I've met that have a heart, like the heart that, this, that, that Neil had. And, um, and, you know, and I, and I got to take care of him the last few years that he was alive and, and I was with him when he passed away, which was, it was a privilege and a gift. And, and I would say to anyone who's ever, like if you've ever got someone who you're close to, I found that death is actually a very peaceful thing. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, I think it's something that um, I've had the opportunity to be around a few people now that have passed away in the last few years. And, and I've really been grateful for the, being able to be there for them. I lost my grandmother who was probably one of the closest people in my life. And, uh, and it's just taught me it's, 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 uh, it's kind of like the same thing with the plants, like being on the farm, like being around death to seeing like how it's just part of life. It is. And, you know, I think we're, it, a, a lot of this 
conversation that we've had today is about there's been a lot of talk about fear that you've had fear of being who you were being uh, having fear of maybe succeeding or finding love or you know being afraid and i think with death there's something about it that there, there's this fear of the unknown of maybe mm-hmm. what's to come next or there's a fear of how am i going to live my life yeah. without this person yeah. but i so like you i've been around uh, a few people that i really care for had a really big impact on my life who've passed away and it it's probably one of the most peaceful things to witness in life and it and it's hard but i think for me when i've seen it happen i almost think that it makes it a little bit easier to to see especially if someone is in pain or suffering from a disease like cancer or something like that i think uh, it just makes for me, it's made the process just a little bit easier to be like, that person's not in pain anymore. Yeah, yeah. So you find yourself now on the farm after Neil is gone. Yeah. And what do you do? Yeah, so he, he had like actually three farms. It was the main one that, we, that he and I stayed on. And he left me an opportunity to, to, to buy the, the, the one that, that I was on and uh, with, with him. And, and it was on a land contract and it was pretty, um, it was a great opportunity, but also there was a big responsibility to make the payments on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't know how I was going to do that. And, <laughs> and my, my family and my friends, like every time when I was like, oh, I don't know how this is, this is like, I don't know how this is going to, how this is going to work. They showed up. There was always someone who was there that showed up. Mm. It's kind of like uh, when you said that and just thinking about the conversation that we've had today is that you're it was almost like at one point in your life, your family had to leave you alone Mm -hmm. to figure things out and let them kind of get well and you figure yourself out. And all of a sudden, now that everyone's kind of like, everyone is on in a better place, they sort of like came to the rescue. And you're right. And it's interesting because it was, it was such a great opportunity because what happened was, is so after Neil passed away and I was in the process of growing the, we had a farm, we had a farmer's market for a farm stand that had been there for years. And and he was known for growing these cantaloupe that that normally would not grow in that area because the growing season's too short, but he would grow that. He would start them off in a greenhouse in April. I was still frosting in, in Michigan and then transfer them um, in late May into the ground. And so then by- Into the fields. Yeah, into the fields, yeah. right, yes. And so they, we, were, we were known for people would come from literally like, like no, no kidding, I remember somebody telling me they'd driven an hour and a half just to buy these melons from, from Indiana. Um, <laughs> cantaloupes. Right, yeah, these cantaloupes, yeah. yeah. And, and so I was like, I felt like a duty to, to carry that on, but also like I felt missed, I felt that there was also opportunities to, to, to grow the business. So we, I started growing sweet corn, uh, sunflowers, pumpkins, and I, <laughs> uh, I wanted to extend the growing season, right? Yeah. Yeah. you know, to make more money. And then I also, it was, you know, this is like a hundred acre farm, right? And and it was really lonely without him being there. Mm-hmm. Like I missed my friend and I had all this space, right? And so my dad and my mom and a lot of other people came up and we took the first floor of the house and it was over a hundred years and we, we redid it. Yeah, we, we, you know, those weekend warrior yeah. projects that your family yeah. loves doing. Exactly, <laughs> Dad and I made this. The, we did the trim and everything, all from like you know from scratch and real good craftsmanship, and you know hired out a little bit of work on some stuff we couldn't do. But it, we, we just transformed, and we had been transforming the farm for over five years. Neil and I had. Yeah, well, I mean, you should say too with the the trim work, especially because you brought that up. You should just say that the tr- that your dad, you the two of you, you matched that trim work to the original trim yeah. work of the house. Yeah, that's right? true. I mean, it wasn't just like. Like you put up some wood on a, uh, you know, around some doors. Yeah. It was very uh, particular how it was that. done. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Forgot, I actually forgot about that. Yeah, like so it, kind of, so you could, so it all matched. You couldn't tell what was done from over a hundred years ago to, you know, it was yeah. it was, and it was such an experience. Um, and like you know, with being able to to have them help me because I was doing most of the work myself up there. And we, we would have some labor every now and then that I would hire, but so many times, like and I didn't have the cash to be able to, cause I was trying to pay this land contract off that, that they would show up, you know, whenever I, there was never any questions asked and they would work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, <laughs> they never questioned. And it was just a really, it was a really great experience. And then what I will say is, is that once that, that was completed and then that the, the, the first floor of the house became kind of like, like a bed and breakfast for lack of better terms, because we were surrounded by all these wineries and we're only an hour and 15 minutes away from Chicago, that people would come on the weekends during the fall and the spring for like, you know, 
winery tours and stuff like that. And then in the summer we would have like a lot of families and stuff. And I would be like taking kids out like on the tractors and stuff out into the field, like pumpkin patch stuff. And it was just to be able to then my heart was hurting with him not being there, but I knew what I was missing was, was, was love and connection. Hmm. And so it was very much like what I was been hearing from myself, like from, not from what people have been teaching me was like, if you're craving something or something's hurting, you need to do like, what is the action? Yeah. So like, what is it? This was, this was then, and this is what's now. And, and so like after the other thing that happened after Neil died, I, sorry, before you go too far, what you just said. So just like uh, backing up a second here, you, you just said, um, so many of us get stuck in the past mm-hmm. and how it used to be, right. how it used to be. Well, things change. Yeah. Things are always going to change. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how hard we don't want things to change. Change will always happen or creep into our life. Right. But it's always, how do I take, so it's not, it, it doesn't necessarily, it, it, something can't be the same way because if there's someone who dies, right? right? You, it's just, you can't bring that person back. Right. But then how do you take that experience and how do you create it within the present that you have today? Mm-hmm. And I think so many of us get stuck mm-hmm. in the past and right. we're not, we can't, we just can't, I'm using my, I'm pushing my hands forward. It's almost like bulldoze mm-hmm. through. It's like, it doesn't have to be that tough. Mm-hmm. It's just once you understand what it is that you're missing or what it is that you're craving, yeah. it's then being able to craft that in your future. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you know, and change, change is not easy, but you know what, like there like if you're missing something, there's an opportunity to create something, something new, something new. Yeah. And that is, that's like, that's living, right. That's, mm. um, and, and, I, and I, I will say like, there were some times where I was like, Holy heck, what did I get myself into? You know, sure. like what did I, what did I sign up for here? Right. But that's any big undertaking. Yeah. That's anybody, you know, that's anyone who goes through yeah. any sort of big undertaking. Yeah. And then I think to, since to, to be able to, I mean, it wasn't the, 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 this huge, Operation. It was a, it was a family farm that had been in the family for a couple of generations, and you know he was born there and had lived his whole life there. Yeah, you know, and it was doable, like by like a couple of people to make it run. So I had a, a couple of people. I've had multiple people in my life over the years, and that I still continue to do that have teachers in my life that I go to that mentor me. And uh, I remember there was a couple of things that happened right about the same time. The the one friend had told me he said, uh, you know, he's like Jeff. He's like you. He's like, I think you're at a place where I can tell you this because I was probably complaining about how somebody hadn't treated me nicely or something. And he was like, <laughs> Jeff, he's like, you kind of um, you kind of walk around with resting bitch face. And I was like, and I wanted to be like, like, how dare you say that to me? But as soon as he said that, I was like countless memories of pictures and photographs. I was like, oh, I saw myself and, yeah. I, and I just had this miserable look on my face, yeah. right? And so from that, from like literally the next day, like as I was going out, like going to the grocery store, go, like doing this, like people that I would bump into, like on the, your regular day to days, I started smiling at people, mm. and my reality literally changed that next day of the overnight. world, like, overnight, yeah. overnight. And then you know, not too, you know, then after, right, you know, after um, I met the farm, you know, being there with, I'm like, what have I, what have I got myself into? Like, how am I going to do this? Like, and I realized that I had learned just enough. Like he, the last year that he was alive, he mm-hmm. had taught me, he had literally like tied a, a knot through everything. So there was just enough knowledge for me to know what the next right thing was. Yeah. And the thing is, we knew that he was sick, but we thought that he had like probably five to six more years. They, they yeah. thought his, his cancer wasn't aggressive. Unfortunately, it was completely the opposite. And so what happened was I, I was, that spring with the next growing season, I, I was standing in the barn and I was just like, there's so much stuff here. And I'd always mm-hmm. ask him, I'm like, and he, always, he would always tell me where the tool was for this. And we would, a lot of these tools you'd only use like once or twice a year when you're like doing that one thing when it gets oh. used once a year to put the thing in the ground, like to plant, yeah. the, to plant the corn, to lay the plastic for the, and I was like, how am I gonna do this? And I found myself running down to the, the hardware store, like buying something at like three, three or four times a day. And I was like, there's so much here that has been here for the last two or three generations. It's no longer serving its purpose. Hmm. And I was like, it's got to go. Yeah. And so what I would do is every, like literally I started doing an aggressive inventory of every single thing that was in there. And I was dividing things in piles. Like if I don't know what it is, Mm -hmm. I'm uploading it to Facebook on these farmers groups and being like, what is this? What does this do? And these old farmers that were retired, because all the equipment was like 
probably 50 to 60 years old because it was a small enough farm that we couldn't afford to buy like the big new equipment. So we'd always have to get something repaired because a new tractor would cost $100,000 versus this would be like, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. And, um, And what I learned was is that just like that farm to fully run and for it to be efficient, these thoughts that I had about myself and other people were getting in the way of what I was to accomplish here in this life. Huh. And it was no longer about how you had done this to me or what this had happened to me. It was like, no, what do I need to change inside myself? Mm. And I think that was like the biggest. So like whenever, like I remember necessarily like not understanding or disagreeing with somebody or whatever, I'm like, no, like that's their thing. Yeah. Like, right. Like we're all entitled to have like fear and stuff like that. But what do I need to do? Like, how can I be the most helpful in this situation? And and then, you know, and it just, it actually turned out to be like, it just, it took off from there. And, and um, we had a really successful first season and, and it all worked out somehow. Yeah. You know? It always does. It, you listen to any, so <laughs> earlier today I was listening to a, 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 another show, another podcast, and it was somebody about building a company that's a, a very successful company now. And it's like the night before they were supposed to launch their app, was not approved by Apple podcast and they did everything that they could and they made all the phone calls that they could and they could get in touch with people and they, you know, talk to people and they did everything that they could and they went to sleep that night and the next morning that it was in the app store. So it's like, it's just uh, in anything, it just, things just happen when they're supposed to, as long as you put the energy and effort and you do the work. Right. Yeah. You have to, that like it, things are just not going to happen yeah. if you're going to sit in bed yeah. all day, it, right? It, you yeah. have to do the work. And when you do the work, something bigger, a, a bigger force, a, big, a guiding power well, makes those it, makes those things happen and, and for you. I think you. that's a great segue, what you said right there is because like I had these instincts or thoughts that, that needed to be cleaned out, like mm-hmm. that needed to be, you know, put into the right place. And what, what, when I really started this process was is that that, that whisper that, that intuition, Mm -hmm. that intuition that has gotten strong. It's like, you know, I don't question it. Like it says this, I'm like, Oh, okay. And I know now that, you know, you and I have, and the thing is, is that we don't have, we've talked for a while now. And and, and the thing is, is that I've realized I love to start and build things. Yeah. And we've together separately, we've created multiple businesses now together and, and, and events and things. And, and I just like when I get that voice, it's just like okay, all right, but this is the next thing that's got to happen. Yeah, and 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 I find that it's just kind of like dancing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And and from the outside, it might be like, gosh, like that's crazy. Like, but it's just like no, like there is no roadblock that can get get can, when when you start to change your thoughts. Yeah. Just for me, it's like there's nothing, there's there's nothing, there's nothing that can, can you know yeah. can stop you. Yeah, I you know so we're in. LA part time. And, you know, a lot of our friends work in the entertainment business. And I think it's one of those uh, industries that is very, um, there isn't uh, one set way to get anywhere to get into working like if you want like to for acting for even you know working in other parts of you know of the business and I had this thought today it was it also really feels like the same way in any other profession there there's this sort of like this misnomer of like if you go to school you get and you'll be able to get a job Mm -hmm. and a job is going to be is going to create this security and it's going to give you this thing or this money that'll allow you to do all of these things and it's like that that doesn't always pan out Mm there just because you are taking sort of the safe road that that doesn't necessarily it just it's not always the safe bet and it also you know climbing the corporate ladder there's no yeah. there's no one set path right yeah. it but i but if you listen i guess i should back up if you're in tune enough with yourself mm-hmm. and you're connected to sort of this voice within you and mm-hmm. you, whether you want to call that god or the universe or you then start listening to those whispers and you're making decisions based mm-hmm. on something bigger and higher than yourself. That's right. And I think that that could be running a farm. It could be being an actor, auditioning for you know certain things. Uh, it could be uh, building a company. It could be being a secretary in a, in a large corporation mm-hmm. and wanting to climb the ladder. It's when you listen to that voice, that's where you really get the mm-hmm. power and the strength to do anything. Mm-hmm. So I think I almost had this I guess I had this realization today that it's like that is in any 
any way, in yeah. any factor, in any right. working environment, in any career path you're going to take, if you're not connected and you're not listening to yourself and mm-hmm. trusting your gut and trusting your instincts, you're not going to go anywhere. You're yeah. never going to progress in any of it. Yeah. So, yeah. So you are now, so you're uh, at the farm. Things uh, are starting to change. Yeah. You're coming to a realization that you're missing something else in your life. Yeah, there, there, <laughs> like literally, there was. Um, it was like I was. I had basically finished up everything. All my projects were pretty much done. That they had to, like as far as the, the big stuff. And I remember coming across. I was downstairs in the basement, and I found like some old piece of furniture, and I, I pulled it back behind it, and there was a sign that had probably not been seen for over fifty years, hmm. and it said today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, I'm keeping this. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I still have it. And I put it upstairs with my keepsake, like this box of keepsakes I have. And, and in there, there was also, and just follow me for a second. There was also this picture of my dad and I before things had gotten rough when I was a l- little bit older. It was probably from like junior high school. And he and I were at uh, Kings Island and it was him on and I in this roller coaster ride. And this goes kind of back to what you were saying just a minute ago. And we had our hands up in the air and we were screaming with joy in this picture that was taken of us. And then the people that were behind us were clenching on, biting their teeth, miserable and probably hating one another that had convinced each other to go on this ride. Yeah. And, and I just saw like that, like my hands were up in the air and I was just like, I just, I've had to continue just to put my hands up in the air and whatever the next thing is and not to hold on too tight to whatever's right in front of me. And, um, and so I, you know, I was in a pretty good place and I kind of felt like, oh, you know, like I've done, I've made this good. I've made good on what I was supposed to do here. And that later, like probably that night, actually, I, I was laying in bed and you know what, right before you fall asleep, mm-hmm. you're like, you know, something like, jolted me not jolted me but like whispered in my ear and um it was it was your name like literally my name yeah your name (laughs) and i was just like what like you know and um and it it happened and it got louder and louder over the next few months and it was almost like i had done what i was supposed to do there Mm. and and it would and i was was, i'm like do i like i hadn't spoken to you in, in, in years like every now and maybe over those it'd been 10 years since we had dated and maybe like I would say we intersected two or three times, whether we like met up for coffee once or twice or yep. a drink. And it had it'd probably been a while. And um, probably five or six yeah, years. Yeah, five or six years. And so I was just like, I was listening to that. I'm like, now? I'm like, is now the time? And it was like, it would tell me no, not quite yet. And so um, I reached out and I said, hey, I was like, um, I, I, I didn't know what was going to come of it. I just knew that I needed to make right what I had done the harm I had done to, to, to you. And it was time. So I asked, I was like, can, can, we, can we grab coffee? And you said, no. <laughs> you said no, because no, you wanted to grab coffee on a Monday afternoon. I was way too busy to s- stop my whole day for, you know, for to yeah. go grab coffee. I'm like, if you want to be like a normal person, let's have dinner tonight, <laughs> eight o'clock. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a dear friend that has a place in Chicago that let me stay at his place. And uh, I drove over and we, we went to dinner and we the dinner turned into a two or three hour conversation. And um, you asked me if, it became pretty apparent that we were both single but by the end of the, at some point in the evening and you asked me if it was a date and I said no <laughs> because I really wanted to go there with no expectation. I wanted to go there with not expecting to receive anything. I just yeah. wanted to. And then you said, well, next time you're in town. We could have dinner again. Yeah. Not knowing that, I, thinking that, you know, we would see each other very sporadically. Yeah. So I didn't think that anything yeah. was going to. Yeah. So my friend's happen. place that I was staying at that it's kind of like his, you know, um, he wasn't using his place. And I said, hey, can I stay at your place a couple of days longer? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, sure, no worries. And so I called you up and I was like, hey, I'm back in town. Would you like to go to dinner? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. So yeah, so um, you and I reconnected and that is a, was just like, just such a graceful experience. I don't know if like I can even honestly put words into how grateful I am, like how much healing to be able to reconnect with you. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and uh, we got married. (laughs) (laughs) Spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I should also say, I don't know if I ever told you this, but way back when, when we like maybe uh, like a few days before we met the first time, the first time, somebody had said to me, they said, to, they said to me, they said, Anthony, you're going to be such, you're going to be so good when you get to, like to be with someone and be married and like have a family and all of this stuff. And I turned to them and I'm like, I love being single. I never want to be with anyone. <laughs> I'm good. And you literally waltzed into the door and I said to somebody the next day after I met you for the first time, I was like, I'm going to marry that person. And I don't know why I'm saying this because I'm would never have imagined saying that, but I just saw you and I just knew. I was like, oh, all right. Well, I guess I was wrong on that. <laughs> so to, I guess to say the pain of not being able to be together for so long makes being together now a gift and so much more enjoyable, even though sometimes it's tricky and it's hard mm-hmm. because I think you have to acknowledge that, that, you know, yeah, definitely. just like, you know, every yeah. other, uh, you know, person in relationships, whether they're, you know, married or dating or friends or coworkers, whatever that, you know, you go through those times, but to be able to share life together with someone is uh, a real special thing and to be able to do it with you is pretty fun (laughs) well thank you and i would say to anyone who's listening that the the thing that time and time is that as i know that like my partner my teammate my husband that we we have different the thing is we 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 businesses together we have we have some things that are separate some things together we do a lot we have a lot that we have a lot that's going on right now a lot of wonderful opportunities that we get to create together and but the one thing that we have that is important is is that we have this shared desire to figure it out, mm-hmm. right? Is it like yeah. we, we, we like if there's something where it's like we have a disagreement, so it's like okay, well, how are we going to figure this out? Yeah, solution, solution. That's what right? it is. It's yeah. all about what creating a solution to any you know hiccup, problem, whatever it is. Right. And I think you know when you can get in that mind frame of being able to be solution based it really opens up something really beautiful inside of you which i think that's whether you want to call that creativity mm-hmm. you want to call that positive attitude whatever mm-hmm. whatever you want to give that name to it i think what then happens is so many other things start to evolve and change i mean let's just be honest last year in 2020 during the pandemic the first sort of month or so of that shutdown was very, it was unknown. We didn't know what was going to happen. We have businesses that really rely on people gathering. (laughs) So uh, not being able to, you know, have that, but I know having up the, having you as my partner, husband, friend, what I felt and I know is true is that staying, you know, there were days where it was not easy for me. There were days where it was not easy for you, but staying in that solution based Mm -hmm. mindset helped create a lot of the opportunities, Mm -hmm. including this wonderful show that we have. Yeah. Right. It created space for that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and life has just been, uh, just to continue to be a gift. Um, I think that it's important that I remember when you and I started dating again, my dad was going to be flying out of Chicago for work. And there was an opportunity for him to catch a ride with me to the city. And I remember him saying, he's like, things with you and Anthony are good, right? <laughs> like almost like a kid, like excited for like, like, like something. Well, like this a, is after he met me. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I was just like, God, like I would have never have thought that this would ever be possible. Yeah. That, like that my, that, you know, my, my parents, the thing is also is like, I was able to work through some of the stuff that I had so that I was able to, be around them. We were around to be able to be around each other and like to get to experience things with each other and with the people in our lives. And for, and I can't speak for their experience, but like to have my mom and my dad at our, at our wedding um, and to dance, you know, for you to dance, you know, for me to be able to dance with your grandmother and your, your mother's no longer with us, unfortunately, but, and if you'd be able to dance with my mom and our dads to be there celebrating <laughs> us. Well, and not only that, but our entire, yeah. not just immediate family, but our entire extended yeah. family, all of them coming together yeah. and it being like one big love fest, yeah. which I, that doesn't always happen yeah. when you have two families come together. Right. And I would say to anyone who like, who's like, there were years where is that how much that we can create fa- family doesn't have to be 
right. you know, immediate. Like there was so many years where there, you know, Neil was was my family. You yeah, know, we were each other's our chosen family. family. Our chosen family. You know? Well, and it it only bears to mention that at our wedding, it was our family and, and our chosen, chosen, yeah, family. And chosen family. That's who the was there. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a wonderful. It's it's life is it continues to surprise me. Mm -hmm to challenge me, um, to scare me at times, but then it excites me because I know that on the other side of that roller coaster, there's gonna be a, a big smile. Yeah. Um, and especially you know, when we all get to do it together. Um, mm -hmm. So Makes it that yeah, much better. None of us have a bad day all on the same day. And so, you know, when we get to come together like we've done, you know, with this and other things, we're so much, we, we weren't, we, there's just so much more that can, can be done. Well, I, uh, I thank you for being able to share your story, your input, and give us a lot of insight today. I know that I've learned some new things, and I hope everybody listening uh, was able to uh, get a better insight on the co-host that normally leads the show. <laughs> so thanks for uh, sitting down and doing this, and thanks for all you do for us and the world. And, uh, you know, I love you. <laughs> thanks. I love you too. <laughs> Jeff was able to remind us that being able to accept oneself and struggles is the key to unlocking the power to begin to live the life you were meant to live. Jeff has some great resources to share. Be sure to visit his profile page on our website at www.talkoutloudlive.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talk Out Loud. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, rate us, and share with a friend. You can also follow us on social media at Talk Out Loud Live. If you or someone you know has an inspirational story and a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, we'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us on our website at www.talkoutloudlive.com. On our website, you can also catch up on past episodes, learn more about our past guests, and browse their profiles. You can also get your official Talk Out Loud gear in our online store and browse our online bookstore curated with our guests' recommended books. Thanks again for listening. And remember, be true, be you, and to talk out loud. <laughs>